a more personal touch, a more interesting flavor that um, we'll see if, if you agree. And I'm a big Star Wars fan, so also kind of <laughs> Star Wars and 100 Objects. Steve, yes? So, the RCAF timeline. Um, as I said, First of April, 1924, was when the RCAF stood up. It's had a bunch of different guises, both before that date and after. Um, before 1924, there were what I, I like to call four proto-air forces. So they were not the RCAF proper, but they were steps along the timeline to the creation of the R RCAF. Um, you might know some of the stories. You might not know all of them. The uh, first one was the Canadian Aviation Corps, which lasted for a very brief time in 1914. Sir Sam Hughes, uh, our Minister of Militia at the start of the First World War. Um, how do I describe him? A unique individual, um, not shy, probably more than a little pompous. Didn't want to have much to do with aviation, but kind of talked into doing it. So they ended up buying one single aircraft. The uh, <laughs> sum total of the personnel in the, uh, the CAC were three people. They uh, bought this clapped out, um, well, virtually clapped out, seaplane, they promptly boxed it up, took it over to Europe, and it was never rebuilt, never flew, and uh, that was pretty much the end of the story of uh, the Canadian Aviation Corps. Mm -hmm. The next one was the, uh, the Canadian Air Force, the first uh, iteration of the Canadian Air Force, and that was stood up in 1918, in about October 1918, and if you know your First World War history, you know the war ended uh, about a month later, so obviously it didn't get into combat at all. The idea was they wanted to have a Canadian Air Force to support the Canadian Corps over in France. Uh, Billy Bishop, among others, was a big supporter of this idea. They wanted Canadians to get credit for the flying that they were doing. Uh, after all, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 25% of all pilots in the British Flying Services, the Royal Air Force and the, the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service, which came before, were Canadians, which is really quite remarkable. Um, but it, really came to nothing. There was a Royal Canadian Naval Air Service that was stood up in Nova Scotia in 1918, mostly to deal with the uh, the U-boat threat on our East Coast. But again, it came too little and too late and didn't really do anything. And then finally, there was a second Canadian Air Force um, after the first one was disbanded in the UK. A second one was stood up in Canada in 1920. And it lasted for four years. It was really the same organization as the Royal Canadian Air Force, but it, just with the addition of the, the Royal um, in the front of the name. And uh, then, like I, I said, we can't forget the British Flying Services because there were so many Canadians like uh, Billy Bishop and Raymond Collishaw and uh, William Barker and uh, all the great aces, plus all the other pilots that we don't know their names off the top of our heads. That, um, maybe never served in the Canadian Air Force or the Royal Canadian Air Force, but are part of the legacy that the service adopts. And then the RCAF itself has a number of different iterations. The, the first Royal Canadian Air Force only lasted until 1968, um, when there was this uh, strange beast called unification that was imposed on the Canadian Armed Forces, where all three services, the Navy, the Army, and the, the Air Force, sort of lost all their individual and, um, identities and became the Canadian Armed Forces or Canadian Forces. So we just had the air element at that point. Um, then uh, Air Command was stood up in 1975, which is sort of rebuilding the uh, the RCAF in all but name. And then finally in 19, sorry, 2011, the actual Royal Canadian Air Force name was reestablished. So this period between 1968 and 2011, there was no official RCAF, the Royal Canadian Air Force, but it was there in all but name, and I'm probably going to call people uh, Air Force officers and RCAF officers from that period, and uh, don't crucify me if I do mm -hmm. that, even if it wasn't strictly proper to use that terminology. <clears throat> so let's get into the objects. Here, we have an A.Y. Jackson painting. Who was that? Group of Seven. Group of Seven, exactly. Very famous uh, Canadian painter. What the heck does this have to do with the Air Force? This is, of, of all my favorites, this is my absolute favorite, and it's the one object that really got my attention as to what this uh, book could really be. 
So an A.Y. Jackson painting. If you look really closely, and I'll give you a zoom there, uh, it's got the name, not very um, PC today, but it's um, Indian Village and Yellowknife or something like that. But then it's got a tag that makes it interesting and connects it to that lady, the Queen of England, Elizabeth II, and in particular her coronation. So this painting was presented by the CDC, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, to the Royal Canadian Air Force in 1952 in honor of their role in Operation Coney Express, which is this fantastic story about scooping the Americans and getting film of the coronation on the air in Canada before it was ever aired in the US on the same day the coronation happened. Um, this is all in the days before um, satellite broadcasting. Of course, radio was able to, to jump over the Atlantic, so there was a live broadcast on the radio of the coronation, but there was no uh, TV feed. But they wanted that TV feed. The Canadians wanted it, the CBC wanted it. So there was a partnership between the BBC, the CBC, the RCAM, and the RAM to get this film over to Canada to sweep so it could get on that same day. And the way it worked out was the BBC broadcast it over the air in the UK. Uh, the CBC acquired special televisions that they literally filmed off of with a film camera while it was being broadcast. It was then developed very quickly, put on an RAF helicopter, taken to Heathrow, put on a, a Canberra jet bomber, RAF, flown across to Newfoundland, transferred to a Canadian CF-100, a jet fighter flown to Montreal. In Montreal, a uh, RCA helicopter met it, took it to the CDC stations in downtown Montreal, and by 4.15 on the afternoon of the coronation, it was on the air across Canada by CDC. Beat the Americans by about half an hour for 45 minutes. <laughs> huge. Like, absolutely huge. And this was Operation Pony Express. And uh, in honor of that close cooperation, the CDC gave the RCA this painting, uh, uh, A.Y. Jackson painting. And ever since then, it's hung in various places in Winnipeg. Uh, I think it's in New York Command headquarters right now. Just an absolutely remarkable story. So there's the, uh, the plaque. I don't know if you can read that. But it's uh, Indian Village Yellowknife A.Y. Jackson, presented to the RCAF by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation to commemorate Operation Pony Express a notable achievement in bringing the television broadcast of the coronation to Canada, June 2nd, 1953. And there's just a few pictures of the, the coronation, uh, the Canberra jet bomber, not the one that actually took part, but just representative. And then at the bottom, that's actually the uh, CF-100 uh, arriving in Montreal, flown by Wing Commander George Nickerson, uh, Second World War uh, veteran but he'd been uh, given the task of, of flying that precious cargo from Newfoundland to uh, Montreal. All right, a spoon. Any guesses on this one? Anybody read the name on there? Birchall. Birchall. Leonard Birchall who is known as the savior of Salon. Uh, he was a uh, RCAF pilot, uh, 413 squadron. He flew uh, Catalinas. And there he is sitting in the cockpit of his uh, Catalina. So uh, if anybody doesn't know what the Catalina is, it's a massive flying boat that was used to, uh, to patrol over uh, water or oceans uh, to look for enemy submarines. Well, in 1942, the Canadians dispatched 413 squadron to uh, Southeast Asia to, uh, to Burma to uh, uh, help deal with the, the Japanese threat down in that part of the world. Uh, a few days after arriving, Virgil was sent out on patrol and he discovered a Japanese fleet that was making an attack on Burma. Um, he was promptly jumped by six uh, Japanese Zeros from the carrier Hiryu, which would subsequently be sunk at Midway. Uh, the Zeros uh, swarmed him and while evading them, his radio operator managed to get a warning off to Rangoon and uh, the headquarters there saying, hey, there's a lot of Japs here, uh, you need to be careful. Um, Virgil ended up getting shot down. Uh, two of his men were killed. Um, 
The rest made it into a lifeboat. Two more were subsequently killed when they were machine gunned by Japanese fighters in the water. But they ended up getting picked up, and uh, they spent the rest of the war in a uh, Japanese prison camp. His message, however, made it uh, possible for the British to mobilize all of their ships, most of their ships, and get them out of the harbor and uh, not get sunk by the, the Japanese attack, which happened soon after the spotting. And, and for that, he was known as the savior of Ceylon. Now, the spoon, the spoon was something that he carved while he was in prisoner of war camps in, um, in Japan. I think it was Japan. Um, certainly, he ended up in a prisoner of war camp in Japan. And he was a really important figure because uh, if, if you know anything about the treatment of Allied prisoners of war by the Japanese, it was terrible. Um, poorly fed, malnourished, diseases, mistreatment, beatings, things like that. Um, Birchall, as a, a senior officer, made it his duty to protect his men. And uh, the story is that he took untold beatings himself by stepping in to protect his men and make sure they didn't get beaten or things like that. And uh, he saved a lot of his men. The uh, death rates in, in Japanese prison of war camps tended to be 30% or more. Um, the ones that he was in towards the end of the war, he got the death rate down to 2% or lower. Um, and a lot of that is on the course of his own personality. And this spoon here, I, I think, is representative of that. Uh, they didn't have much. They didn't have even the utensils to to eat with that were provided by the Japanese, so he had to carve his own spoon and uh, keep it with him so that he could actually have something to eat with. And it was uh, valuable enough to him that he brought it home with him and kept it safe until he uh, eventually passed away and then it was donated to the uh, National Air Force Museum of Canada in Trenton. I should have mentioned, if you look on the right side of the screen, I've got the museum that each of the objects is from, so you can get a sense of the sort of cross-Canada nature of what I've got here. So just a, a couple other pictures. The Catalina is the flying boat <coughs> in behind the men. These are a whole bunch of members of, of Fort 13 Squadron just before they left England on their way over to, uh, to Burma. And Birchall is, who's this guy right here? And the picture on the right I, I threw in, it was when he went back to uh, uh, Burma in about 2006 to uh, unveil a monument to the, the men of 413 Squadron that, that died during the Burmese campaign. And uh, Birchall is the longest serving uh, Canadian officer in the history of, of the Canadian military. Um, he has the, the CD, the Canadian Forces Decoration, and five bars. Um, you get it for 12 years of service, and then I forget how you get a bar. But he had 62 years of service in uniform total, um, because after he retired from the military, he remained uh, working with the military as honorary colonels so of 413 Squadron and, and 400 Squadron and, and other capacities like that. So yeah, 62 years, longest serving Canadian in uniform. Um, I understand that some of the uh, the monarchs um, served longer and technically uh, outlast his claim, but I think his is about a different nature of service. So really, really impressive man. All right. I know somebody was saying what this was before. Yeah, rescue acts. Um, this is the kind of thing that were carried on, on aircraft during the Second World War in case there was any trouble so the men could use it to do whatever they had to, to bash their way out of uh, a problem or, or get somebody out that was trapped. Um, in and of itself, the rescue acts is, is not terribly unusual, rather uh, humdrum, boring even. But this particular one has a connection to this airplane. Anybody recognize that airplane? Minarski. Minarski's Lancaster, exactly. Um, Andrew Minarski was a, um, a mid upper gunner in a, a 419 squadron Lancaster, and his crew went on a mission in June 19. 44, right after D-Day, to bomb uh, some marshaling yards at Cambrai. Uh, while they were en route, they were uh, located by a German night fighter who shot up two of their engines on, I think it was the port wing, or the left wing, but it could have been the right wing, I'm not sure. Uh, captain gave the order to abandon ship because the aircraft was burning and they were going to be crashing. Uh, Minarski went through his um, uh, movements to get the parachute on so he could jump out. And just as he was about to jump, he looked back into the tail of the aircraft and saw that the tail gunner, uh, Pat Brophy, his best buddy, 
was trapped there. The uh, knife fighter attacked and jammed the turret. He couldn't turn it so he could get out, and he was stuck in the turret. So Monarski, rather than saving himself, which he could easily have done, um, he went back to try to help his buddy out, grab that rescue axe, and uh, started trying to bash at the turret to get it free to, to save Pack. Um, he went through flames. The rear of the two slugs was.